Good morning, good morning. It's a lovely morning. It's uh, 22nd of October, 2020. And uh, on my way to work as usual. Work has gone pretty crazy, you know. I mean, we are... Um, I'm having to revert to the uh, ways of working that I used to work in the 80s, which is where you get so booked ahead uh, that you have to make space for emergencies on the day because you don't have any space on the day. Normally we would have had space, but uh, 10 uh, now, uh, I think it's 10 to 10.30 or no, 10.30 to 11. We, we have like a space that you can only book on the day. So, um, which is a nuisance because, I mean, if we start at 8.45, so you've got a session from 8.45 to 10.30, but which is, you know, it's just about enough for a crown prep or a, some sort of surgical extraction or something. But it splits your day up, you know? And then what happened was that we were supposed to finish at five and I'm very keen to get out and go home at five. I think that's only fair on the start. And um, now, um, we're not going home uh, most days until six, which is, that's not entirely unplanned. And the reason for that is that there's a road closure and therefore the traffic is such that if you leave at four, you're okay. And if you leave at six, you can drive straight through. If you leave at five, then you still get home at six. Uh, you just uh, end up sitting for an hour in traffic. And so, uh, we're choosing to spend an extra hour at work productively rather than an hour sitting in traffic unproductively. But um, So that's only a temporary thing, but what with the sort of deep clean we have to do on the surgery every evening, we used to aim to finish at, uh, you know, the last patient used to finish at five, and then um, we could just very quickly tidy up and be out. Whereas now you can't very quickly sort of do anything and be out. You have to deep clean, which takes half an hour. So that means the last patient really has to be out of the practice by half past four. And even with that, even with the last patient being out of the practice half past four, we're still finding people ringing up, say at three o'clock, two o'clock, saying, I, I'm in severe pain, you know, I need help, or I've broken a tooth and it's hanging off a piece of gum. These are new patients. These are not patients of mine, new patients. And, um, you know, what do you do? You just say, well, all right, I'll tack you on the end of the session, you know. I don't have the, I don't have the cojones to say to these patients, no, I'm sorry, we can't do anything for you, you know, you'll have to ring someone else. And uh, that is what other practices are doing because uh, uh, we know, you know, when people ring us, they say, oh, thank God, oh, thank God you can see us, you know, you're like there's the 10th dentist we've rung and they all said they can't see us until March or, or something. And uh, so, <clears throat> but we never turn anyone away in pain, never. Uh, you know, if it means working till midnight. Someone said to me the other day, what time do you finish? And I said, we finish when the last person in, who needs us, who's in pain, has been dealt with, you know. Uh, well, we had a couple of... Uh, my impression is that the patients that we're seeing are uh, further down the road in terms of disease than they used to be. I suppose that's not surprising considering all the checkups have been cancelled. But um, for those of you who are sort of, you know, Department of Health proponents of uh, trying to get dentists to do fewer checkups, I just like, thought I'd let you know that uh, almost everything we are seeing now needs root filling. Um, and it's not a simple, we're not doing any, uh, we're not finding any simple decay unless it's ancillary to another problem. So for example, someone might come in, uh, you know, and need a root filling and then we'll, we'll just say, oh, well, you've got another tooth that's in, in the early stage of decay. And that's not what they came in about and, it's, and they don't even know it's going on. But um, certainly we're, we're not uh, doing checkups and picking up early decay now. The checkups that we do, because we're a preventive practice, there, there, there is no disease. We, we're not picking up, we have no decay, we have no or very little gum disease now. Um, and, and picking up a healthy sort of two and a half, three thousand pounds a month just for doing prevention. Um, but uh, all of our uh, pay as you go work is coming through new patients. Um, and 
principally from uh, a few dentists in mainly in Birchington who are uh, you know messing things up really badly and uh, I don't know I don't know whether they're sitting back and just uh, collecting their one twelfth of their annual UDAs for doing 20% of the work in return for a promise not to not to uh, use the situation to improve their private practice you know to do a private conversion the feedback anecdotally from the technicians and this is how dentists find out what's going on about another dentist we don't talk to each other or don't visit each other's practices much but what we do is we all talk to our technicians and the technicians are uh, insatiable gossips and uh, visit a lot of different practices and then of course they talk to the receptionists and the receptionists tell them quite innocently what's going on you know mr so-and-so's during court on thursday or uh, one of the associates has ordered another great box of drugs from 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 the dental supplier and taking it home <laughs> all that, all, we get all that stuff you know so and so uh, so and so a nurse uh, went out and uh, found that someone had thrown up in the car park and uh, was annoyed because they had to clean it up and then they found out that it was one of the members of staff who'd come in and <laughs> absolutely <laughs> plotto <laughs> all this stuff anyway so all this gossip goes and you know, I, I don't, when I say gossip I mean it's basically news that travels fast you know it's not uh, necessarily made up some of the stuff about um, uh, the very the very unfortunate stuff about technicians committing suicide over the drop off in uh, you know laboratory work and stuff like that I mean I'm sad to hear that and I don't necessarily think that's not true but that's a little bit too far that's like a friend of a friend of a friend of a friend said that you know you have to be a little bit uh, careful oh sorry junction of death always have to pay attention to that but um, yeah so so we're getting a lot of people in and we're starting to see these really really large cavities uh, between the teeth you know the ones that look like an apple where it looks like someone's taking a big bite out of an apple because they've been going for a long time and they're not uh, they've never never been diagnosed and then the patient comes in and says the tooth are twinging a bit when they bite on it and you say yeah that's because it's you've got a big decayed cavity in the nerve and it now it needs a root filling so what we've had to do is we've had to start putting an emergency session in at four o'clock so now between 4 and 4.30 we can't book up except on the day and uh, if uh, someone rings at 3 then they're told to come in at 4. If nobody rings between sort of uh, 11 o'clock and, uh, and 4 uh, then, and, and as a result nobody's booked in at the 4 o'clock session then we, we just tidy up and go home and I think we deserve it because you know for every day we go home at 10 past 4 we go home at 10 past 6 so it's really swings and roundabouts but it's unusual you know it's unusual for me to be sort of booked up solid two weeks ahead and then and to have to have literally one hour of my day set aside just to see emergencies and they are I mean the phone is ringing ring 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 every morning uh, you know oh, I don't can I don't know whether you can you help me I don't know whether you can help me you know uh, I've got severe toothache. Do you, do you have any availability? And we go, well, yeah. What's the problem? You know. And they're like, oh my God. You know. I mean, <laughs> is this? Have I phoned the dentist in some sort of alternative universe where everything's still working? You know. And we go, yeah. We can see you today. Yeah. But let, you know. But I do always say, what's the problem? You know. I don't say because if they say, oh, um, uh, you know, I've got a feeling falling out, but it's not really hurting and. I just need to put back in again then obviously I'll book them in three or two or three weeks time I say well that's all right that can wait a couple of weeks but we will sort you out but then if someone says uh, uh, you know they've got like they have broken a chunk of tooth off or something and it's rubbing their tongue then uh, we get them in and get them sorted out so I don't know honestly I don't know what's going on in terms of provision NHS provision Kent it's it's very strange they, they I, I don't believe for a minute that the, I mean the feedback the scuttlebutt this is what I was getting round to from the technicians is that 
um, that pretty much all the local dentists have been told to uh, put NHS on hold. In other words, to do the absolute minimum, 20%, and, uh, uh, and then basically just concentrate on filling up the rest of the week with private. And by private, I mean NHS patients who can't get an appointment have decided to come private. And I don't like that type of private conversion. I honestly always said that uh, if, um, you know, I don't want to see a patient privately just because they can't get NHS. And if someone comes in and says, you know, I, um, I've got a problem, but my NHS dentist says he can see me next Friday, but I'd like you to sort it out because I can't wait until then. Then immediately I'm thinking to myself, okay, we'll sort this problem out and then get this patient back to their NHS dentist. I'm not, I'm not thinking, uh, here's a patient who is having supply problems on the NHS, therefore I might be able to uh, explain to them that uh, their only option is to go private. I don't, if a patient is, um, doesn't want to spend money on their teeth or is not convinced of the advantages of uh, having a dentist that can spend more time and use better quality materials, use better laboratories, then, then really they're not in our market, you know, we're not interested in a patient who's not like that. Um, all of our patients are, know, know why they come to see me, and, uh, <laughs> but there is still this pervasive uh, feeling, isn't there, in the profession that, uh, you know, I'm on the National Health Service, and if you're private, it's because there's no National Health Service in your area. And I've said to, <laughs> patient I've said to dentists at uh, uh, postgraduate meetings look um, your uh, you know I would like you to come up and set, set up next door to me uh, hello you see their faces when you say that you say look I'm gonna, this is my address please come and set up next door to me on the National Health Service and, they, and they're like well what's what why are you saying that you know surely you'd lose all your patients and I'm like, I would not lose one of my patients. Not one of my patients would come and see you. <laughs> but I tell you who would come and see you. All the patients who don't want to see me, but do need a dentist. And they want a cheap dentist because he doesn't take much time to do the work and he uses cheap materials and cheap labs. Those sort of patients will come and see you and that would stop them ringing up me. That would stop them wasting my time <laughs> and saying, do you do do you take on NHS patients? To which I'm like, you know, I now say, look, you need, you need to ring 111 to get an NHS dentist. That's all I say now. And I, I used to say like that, I think there's a dentist in, I think there's a dentist in Beltinge that does a, a NHS, or I think there's a dentist in Sandwich that does NHS. But I live in Ramsgate. Oh, well, you know, well, <laughs> that doesn't change the fact that they're the only two NHS dentists in the area, you know, and so you get into some big debate about them. Sorry, but I don't have a car. I haven't got a car. And you're like, well, I'm sorry for that. You know, I'm sorry for the reason that you haven't got a car. But it doesn't change the fact that they're the only two NHS dentists in Kent. And it's not my fault. You know, if I was given the money, if I was given all the money that was raised through national insurance and tax to pay for the NHS dental service, there would be dentists all over Kent. There would be NHS dentists all over Kent. But I'm not in charge. I'm not given the money. I've, I've, I've applied for it. I've applied for the job of allocating the money. But they, the powers that, you know, the establishment, the powers that be saw fit to turn me down, turn my application down. And so as a result, there are only two NHS dentists in East Kent. You know, just get used to it. I don't, I think the problem was that uh, when uh, the NHS uh, started collapsing, which is, let's say, for the sake of argument, I would say probably 19, late 80s, early 1990, 1992, people of my generation will recognise those dates as being contract dates, national strike dates, etc. Um, the government at that time should have said uh, to the dentist, look, you're either private or NHS. We're not going to uh, tolerate any um, mixed practice. And at that time, faced with the choice of do I give up the NHS or do I give up the private, 99% of dentists would have just given up the private and stayed on the NHS. And they could have knocked the private market on the head at that point. It would have been very good for the very few remaining private dentists. Um, but uh, the government chose to say, no, we, we want a mixed market. 
now what's happened is that uh, obviously dentists are still there's still a lot of NHS because it, at the end of the day it's free money isn't it it's money with no quality strings attached no no dental reference officers <laughs> no regional dental officers attached no inspection no testing um, and so of course who wouldn't want to pick up that free money providing you can sleep at night which apparently they, they seem to be able to but um, now uh, faced with the same choice which is do you want to give up your NHS practice or do you want to give up your private practice I think most people would say I'll give up my NHS and certainly when you are uh, doing 20% of your work on the NHS and 80% of the work privately um, even if it is because you're doing this wrong type of conversion which is a forced conversion um, due to lack of provision in the area then uh, the government is now well, if they if they try to apply that apply that solution you know the forced choice I think it would go against them it, it would certainly go the wrong way now and especially when you consider that uh, turnover by patient numbers and turnover by patient income are two completely different things. So there are plenty of practices who have got um, uh, more NHS patients than private patients, but equally more private income than NHS income. You know, there's always this uh, this problem that uh, the private side of the practice subsidise the NHS side and um, overall overall it worked out Remember, and, and you may say well that's business madness I mean, why would you run two types of business one where what made a loss and one that made a profit and cross subsidise and the answer is that the one arises out of the other in other words uh, they've got this problem that if they don't have any NHS patients then they won't have any private patients because their private patients, bear in mind, as I say, their conversion is based on deprivation of service, uh, come, come arise out of uh, the problems, for example, where the patient, you tell a patient that you can't have a crown on the NHS, but you can have the crown privately. But you have to have that patient in the first place. They have to be in the chair on the National Health Service to be told that they can have only have certain things like the hygienist privately, yeah? So what happens is that you sort of almost force them to cross subsidise themselves and overall you make a profit. But it's totally, uh, what's the word, not illegal but non-legal, non <laughs> it's against the regs. You're not, you know, having accepted a patient on the NHS, you're contractually obliged to do all the treatment necessary to secure and maintain their oral health on the National Health Service. But it's widely, you know, observed in the breach, and as I say, there's a no inspection and testing or whatever. So, so that's how they get away with it. But um, I think, uh, I think that uh, this, you know, COVID is, in effect, is the massive private conversion. There'll be a big shift towards private, even amongst the NHS practitioners, depending on what deal they're given next year. I mean, if they're given a similar deal, which is like. 100% of their pre-COVID income for 20% of their pre-COVID output, then I would stay on the health service. You know, why not? You know, have another. I'll have a. I'd have a contract like that. <laughs> but uh, our um, what what we are finding in terms of the patients who are coming to us is that the banding system is working really badly, which we always knew it was going to because it's like the three bears porridge. You know, it's. Uh, and so the, the dentists are looking for a filling, and as soon as they see a filling, it's like their eyes go shut. They, that's all they want to see is one filling, because one filling means that they go up into band two. Uh, they get their money, they don't get paid for the second filling or the third filling. It's, they, they're expected to do it free of charge. So they look for one filling, and then once they've found a filling, they do that filling, and then it's cheerio, see you in six months time. And then if there is a second filling there, then, then that's when they want to find it, isn't it? Because they then get paid again for a band two course of treatment. Whereas if they'd done it six months earlier, uh, they, would, they would have, wouldn't have got paid for it. It's just ridiculous, stupid, moronic, Cockroft-esque system. <laughs> that, uh, an Audrey-esque system that uh, where is finally coming home to roost. And that's why when we look at these patients that are coming from the NHS practices that won't see them, we're seeing, we're seeing so much advanced disease. 
because it doesn't pay them to find disease in the early stages. It pays them to find one filling and ignore everything else. So, okay, that's this morning's rant. Nice to talk to you. Talk to you later. Bye.